Hi, so now we're going to turn from using observational studies to try and learn causal effects to kind of the polar opposite randomized experiments. So remember that with observational studies, we just had to kind of take the world as it came. And if we wanted to know the effect of college education or whatever we want to know the effect of, we kind of had to live with all the things that drove college education and that made people who got college education and didn't get college education not equivalent and do our best to use variables we could measure and statistical analysis techniques to try and get a fair comparison and disentangle that the causal effect of college on earnings or whatever. Um, so now we're moving, as I said, to the polar opposite, to the randomized experiments where some evil, all-powerful researcher or researchers just go in and say, bang, you get the one value of the independent variable, the treatment, you don't, which is great for causal evidence. There are, of course, lots of limitations and lots of situations where you can't do randomized experiments, but it's a very powerful technique, and there are a lot of settings in which you can use these, and they've become more and more influential. Um, okay, so on to randomized experiments. Okay, so the example that we have in the book is about time limits on cash benefits, uh, welfare. Um, so what was observed is that the less time that a family stays using such benefits, the more likely they are to find jobs and earn higher wages. Um, some people interpreted that as, boy, needing that incentive that, oh, you're going to lose the money, really pushed people to try to find jobs and and uh, it was, in the long run, it was better for them. And of course, better for the government budget. Um, so they interpreted that as a causal effect. If you put the time limits on people, they'd be more likely to find jobs. Um, but other people are like, nah, that's a common cause. Some people, because of their education, their past job experience, the local job market, and so on and so forth, that basically determines how long they stay using such benefits because of the difficulty in finding a job or not, and of course determines as well their likelihood of finding a job and how much they'll earn on it. Um, so this, and again, you can even think about reverse causation, you know, the easier it is for you to find a job, the less likely you are to stay and continue to get benefits. So to find out, they performed a randomized experiment. The government, or through a contracting agency, the uh, contract research organization, the government ran an experiment. Families were randomly assigned to either the treatment group the new uh, thing at that time, of course, we've had time limits for a long time now, the treatment group versus the control group, which was the status quo, the usual practice. So what does that get you? What design does that have? So here's the overview of a randomized experience. First, you recruit participants, and you can't force people to participate in an experiment. And then you can randomly assign them, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, flip of a coin, whatever, into being in the treatment group or the control group. The treatment group gets this new, different treatment. The control group doesn't. Usual practice, what normally happens. Other than the treatment, everything else needs to be the same for these, but the random assignment takes care of all of that except for the actual treatment stuff. And then the researchers have to make sure that they know and control everything which differs. Then you wait and you get your outcomes, employment, earnings, whatever. 
and then you compare them. So the outcomes are whatever results uh, that you're interested in measured for each subject, each participant in the experiment. So what does that random assignment actually look like? Well, here's an example. You recruit people as you recruit them. So here's the time you might recruit them. For each one, you generate some random number. Um, and that may often be done as a random number between 0 and 100. And then everyone who's below 50 would be the control group, AFDC at the time. And if it's above 50, they get the treatment, um, FTP, uh, in, in the example from the book. Now, a lot of experiments are 50-50. They don't have to be 50-50. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk later about, you know, why you might not want to make that an even mix. But no matter what the mix, so, you know, you could do random number below 75 and random number above 75, and then you'd have three quarters control group, one quarter um, treatment, but it must be random. Why? Because the randomization, first of all, in terms of treatment, is exogenous. It just comes from outside. It doesn't depend on people's individual characteristics. Um, and that produces statistical equivalence, meaning that the difference in means between the treatment and the control groups are trivial, right? And it's also critical that, that this works on all variables, not just the ones we can measure, and we'll look at some measured variables in a second, but it does this for everything, variables you can't measure, variables you can't even imagine. Remember in the control variables, we were worried about um, causal things driving the independent variable that we didn't even know about or hadn't thought about. So what does this statistically equivalent groups look like? So here's your treatment group, here's your control group, conventionally in columns. Then we look at a bunch of variables, of characteristics of the research participants going in or at baseline. And we expect no meaningful differences between the treatment and control. So this is something you always do. You look at the baseline descriptive statistic, looking at the treatment group or the control group, or more arms if you have more arms in the experiment, and you check that they are equivalent. In fact, it's something that you would do as well in um, the natural and quasi experiments that we're going to discuss in the next chapter. So the idea is you look at um, age, education, work experience, anything that you have measures of, and uh, anything that you have measures of and that would be relevant in driving the outcomes you're interested in, and you check that should be about the same. So that's the apples to apples comparison that we were looking for in the uh, last two chapters um, that you know we had to try and get uh, with statistical manipulation. Um, so you're going to compare these, you're going to be the same. So how similar is similar enough? What's enough to be comparable? Um, well, there's no perfect answer to that. You're going to look at both the practical significance and the statistical significance. So the practical significance compares like 7.7 .7 years of work experience and 8 years of work experience and says, you know, how important is work experience to being employed, to getting a job, and earnings, and the other outcomes they care about. How do you decide that? Well, you're hopefully going to have expertise and familiarity in this area. You're going to look at a wide variety of other studies um, to see the effect of additional 0.3 uh, years of experience 
in a population similar to the one you're conducting the experiment. You looked at other evidence, both descriptive and predictive evidence, and hopefully, if you're lucky, some causal evidence. But, you know, not everyone will agree. And often, you know, you can't get it perfect. How do you get your treatment and control arms to be more similar? You get bitter, bigger sample sizes, more research subjects. Well, research subjects are expensive. Um, so sometimes you have to get them not as comparable as you would like them to be. And then you look at that and say, okay, how big a difference might that make? You're also going to look at the statistical significance as well. But don't get into binary thinking about statistical significance. Oh, it's not okay if there are statistically significant differences. You must have none. And if you have no statistically significant differences, you're safe. Neither of those things are true. Remember that the statistical significance, again, depends on how many subjects you have. Um, so if you have tons and tons of subjects, you can have tiny differences, you know, two weeks of work experience difference, but it could be statistically significant. How can that happen in a randomized experiment? You just said it was expensive to get subjects. Usually it is, but sometimes in administrative settings or with online experiments, you can get really big sample sizes now. So don't just say, oh, there's statistically significant differences, no good. Look at the practical significance. On the other hand, sometimes you, uh, so, Sometimes you get uh, non-statistically significant differences, uh, but you're not safe because, you know, you had a small study and they're really not comparable. And that's kind of telling you, oh, we do not have enough research subjects. This is not a big enough study. So we can't emphasize enough the importance of looking at this. And of course, you only have these <clears throat> for your measured variables. You're going to want to use what you observe with the measured variables to think about what implications those might have for unmeasured variables. Another way you can look at the effect of random assignment and the fact that your treatment and control groups are really equivalent is to look at the correlation. So what we want is that the treatment that people get, whether they're in the treatment group or the control group, to be uncorrelated with all their other characteristics. So here you see a correlation matrix, and this one has the random number, right? So the random number, which is the thing which drives treatment or controls, uncorrelated with education, age, work experience. Of course, they're all correlated with each other. The problem we were having in the last uh, chapter with uh, observational studies. So the logic of the randomized experiment is that the real world has all these nefarious real world chains of cause and effect. Lots of self-selection and endogeneity. And what the randomized experiment does is it just cuts through all that. Sure, all these things, they're related to each other and they're all related to the outcome, but we're just going to give it big exogenous push on the treatment and that'll you know propagate through to the outcome and we can get an unbiased estimate of the an effect and that's what gives us our counterfactual that's what gives us the fact that we're confident that the treatment and control groups are the same in every other way all these other variables and ones we can't measure can't imagine they're the same on average between the treatment and the control groups in every way except treatment or control and all its consequences, including the outcome. So returning to our big picture of the experiment, we've got the setup. What about the results? So what you do is you measure the outcomes for each group and then you compare them. And you get a results table which typically looks like this. 
you got your treatment group, you've got your control group, you've got your average for all the outcomes. So here I've I've gotten um, these this fabulously effective experiment. I've also kind of been sneaky and I gave the control group a big boost. You know, maybe there was some went from recession to massive economic boom. Randomized experiments going to take care of that. So I've got my average outcomes for the treatment group, their average income of the treatment group and the control group, their likelihood of being employed. And first I see, are they different? They should be different if the treatment um, was effective. Um, and then how do I calculate our estimated effect from the experiment? Well, the effect of treatment on income looks at the average treatment for the average income for the treatment group minus the average income for the control group. And that difference is the effect of treatment on income, 25.9 thousand in this case. As I said, I had fun and made it really effective. You can do for employment, 89% minus 76% equals 13 percentage points. Wow, arithmetic. Lots simpler than multiple regression and way simpler to all the much fancy, uh, fancier techniques, propensity score matching, the different things people are trying to use machine learning for causal evidence. This is just arithmetic. Pretty easy. Now, um, you're also, and we'll come back to this, going to look at the statistical significance of these differences as well. So, Sometimes, particularly when students are new to this kind of work, they confuse the results uh, experiment, the results table, with the baseline descriptive statistics table because they look really similar. So what I've done here is I've put them in the same table, although basically you would never see this done in a description of the, an actual study. These would be separate tables. But I did this so people can say, oh my god, these look really similar. We got a column for treatment, we got a column control, we got a bunch of variables in the columns, and then we have the, here we have the average of this variable for the treatment group. And again, you know, we got the average for this variable in the um, control uh, treatment group. And we have the same for control group. They play totally different purposes. And we have different expectations. So the characteristics at baseline, baseline means before you run the experiment, if the experiment is done correctly and if you have enough subjects, these things should look the same. Um, the results, the outcomes, are for after you've done the experiment, and if the treatment works, they look different. Of course, maybe the treatment's not effective, and then in the red, the results ones, they'd be different. Um, so again, I've put them in one table so you can get used to the fact that, oh boy, these two kinds of tables look really similar, but in fact, they are completely different. So let's talk some more about the statistical significance of an experimental result. Statistical significance tests have special meaning in a randomized experiment. Um, basically, when you combine the design of a randomized experiment and a statistical significance test, you really can prove or disprove prove causation. So for example, t-test of a difference between two outcomes, quantitative outcomes such as income, means that it between the two outcome means determines if there is a causal effect. How do we square that with what we said before, which again I've put in italics. No statistical significance test can ever prove causation on its own. That is really true, but this isn't on its own. It's with the randomized experiment. Um, so again, I really, really want to emphasize that in general, especially with those observational studies, also when we get to natural and quasi-experiments, and even when we get to things that 
kind of undermine a randomized experiment, making it less of a randomized experiment, some of the human artifacts we're going to talk about. The statistical significance test by itself does not prove causation, but this isn't by itself. It's with the randomized experiment. So in a randomized experiment, if it's not statistically significant, what do you conclude then? Well, you can't conclude that there's definitely no effect. It could be no effect, or it could be just not enough information to know if there's effect. If you have wide confidence intervals or large standard errors, usually due um, to not enough research subjects, not a big enough sample size, then, you know, it's not statistically significant from your randomized experiment. It doesn't necessarily mean there's no effect. It could mean, ah, we just don't know. You got to look at your confidence intervals for that. And what about the practical significance of the estimated effect? Um, how do you evaluate that? Remember that practical significance is the extent to which the magnitude of the effect matters in the real world. It's enough to care about. And remember that practical significance is also called clinical significance in medical or other clinical settings educational significance in an education set, economic significance, and so on. You know, does it matter in whatever context you are looking at? Also called substantive significance. So how do you decide if that matters? And again, this is more of a craft or an art. Um, but there are some important standard ways, and these are not mutually exclusive. You, you should use as many of them as possible. So first you look at the proportional effect. So, you know, hey, that $25.9,000 difference that we got here, how does it compare to the baseline or the control? or the overall average for a population like that. So you're going to compare it to a mean, a median of, of, what it, of what the income was at baseline, of what the income is for the control group, of the overall population for other populations. You're going to compare the magnitude of the effect to, you know, some level of the same thing. So how much is the income increase relative to the income of the control group. You're also going to look at what's called an effect size. That's the magnitude of the effect relative to the standard deviation of the outcome. So the standard deviation is how much does income vary? You know, if income varies a lot and, you know, uh, you've only made a small change relative to the everyday ordinary variability in income, that doesn't look like much. Um, an advantage, uh, um, effect sizes are widely used, especially in education and, and in psychology, in disciplines where, you know, like test scores or indexes, don't have natural units that people can interpret in their own terms. Effect sizes are also good, again, like proportional effects when the units don't mean anything. Say you want to compare effects on income, you know, 80 years apart. Um, you don't want to adjust for inflation. You want to compare between different countries. You have to worry about currencies and so on. Effect sizes and proportional effects can even be compared across completely different things, right? An effect size in education versus an effect size in medicine. So those are important things, and they're a bit more mechanical, but you never, ever want to stop there in assessing practical significance. You also want to think, what does this outcome mean in real world terms? Remember, clinical, you know? If you're changing, um, uh, if you're changing blood pressure uh, of a certain population, is that enough to make a difference 
in mortality, in quality of life, in things that matter. If you're increasing students' test scores, do those test scores make a difference in their actual skills in the labor market? Does it make a difference in them getting into college? And obviously it takes expertise and outside knowledge to make that judgment. Finally, you want to compare to other programs. Hey, maybe your, um, uh, your educational intervention yeah, increased test scores by 5% of a standard deviation. But nobody has anything else that's doing any better. You know, if this is the best thing you have going, then maybe it is enough, even if it makes, you know, only a relatively small or modest difference in real world outcomes, still if it's your best thing going. Okay, so now we've covered the big picture of randomized experiments, why you want to do them, why they provide such great causal evidence, and the big picture of the results and how to interpret results. Later, we're going to talk more about problems with randomized experiments, variations on randomized experiments, more about how to interpret the results, and especially the generalizability. See you then.